Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday Space News Rundown, where I keep you all in the loop about the happenings in the world of Starship development and space biz. And it's a big one today. Four Falcon boosters took to the skies over the course of the week. Booster 8's journey to the stars is seemingly over before it even began. China makes a significant extension to its space station and much, much more. This episode was sponsored by Squarespace, the world's greatest website creation platform. More on them a little bit later on, but first, let's begin with Starship News. I want to begin the Starship News segment by talking about the Starship Orbital Flight Test. So, when will it be? <laughs> Lord knows I've been hyping it up for like over a year now. When's the date? Well, NASA has released a schedule detailing the steps required for the first orbital launch. It clarifies that Booster 7 has successfully completed a 1, 3 and 7 engine static fire test as well as a 33-engine spin prime test, after SpaceX incorporated the necessary repairs and robustness upgrades after the July high-energy event. Very, uh, diplomatic wording there. <laughs> and the schedule also highlights that Ship 24 has completed a 2 and 6 engine static fire as well. The next steps needed before a launch can happen are a Booster 7 and Ship 24 restack, which I guess is already happening maybe, an additional round of propellant load tests, a 33-engine Booster 7 de-stacked static fire test, wet dress rehearsals, and of course the obtaining of an FAA launch license. So I'd say that if we see a Ship 24 D-Stack soon, then this is hopefully a positive sign that a 33-engine static fire test is right around the corner. What isn't right around the corner, though, is any testing or flights for Booster 8, most likely. This is because after a brief stay at the launch area, in which nothing really happened, SpaceX trucked it off to the Rocket Garden, placing it alongside Booster 4 and ships 15, 20, and 21. There's admittedly a very slim chance that Booster 8 is only being placed here for temporary storage and SpaceX still have plans to use it, but this is unlikely to be the case as Booster 9 is pretty much done now and we've so far never seen a Super Heavy or Starship prototype moved to the Rocket Garden and then ever leave again, except for cutting up and scrapping. Over the course of the past week, we saw lots of cryo testing for Ship 24 and Booster 7, as well as Ship 25. All very exciting stuff, but I don't think I need to go into too much detail with these, as you guys know the drill by now. But there was no evidence to suggest that any of these cryo tests yielded poor or undesirable results, so hopefully everything with these three vehicles remains on track. A NASA official last week has confirmed that Raptor 2 engine is at flying speed. SpaceX achieved their goal of producing seven Raptor engines per week or in other words, one engine per day on average, and they actually hit this manufacturing goal about a quarter ago. It's interesting to note that the Raptor 2 produces similar thrust to the legendary RS-25 engine, the engine that used to power the Space Shuttle and now powers the SLS. Yet the RS-25 is being produced at a rate of just four per year which of course pales in comparison to the 365 engines per year pace of Raptor 2. Whichever way you look at it, things are moving at a flare pace. Oh, <laughs> I said flare pace. I meant to say fair pace. <laughs> I guess flare pace does rhyme with fair pace. Just like Squarespace, the sponsor of today's episode of Space This Week. So let me level with you. If you're a small business owner, content creator, musician, graphic designer, or really anyone at all, trying to carve their way through today's modern era, then you need a website. And that's where Squarespace come in. People think of building a website and often anticipate facing walls of coding and confusing interfaces, but this couldn't be further from the case when it comes to building a website with Squarespace. It's easy. Just tell Squarespace what you want your website to be about, be it a portfolio, storefront, non-profit, or a website dedicated to your fictional aerospace company. Choose from a huge range of templates to find the perfect springboard for your site, and then get going. Customize every aspect of your website to your heart's content to make something truly personalized to you. Building a website with Squarespace really is as simple as dragging and dropping, and they're constantly adding loads of new features to make your site the best it possibly can be, including custom merch stores, where they handle all of the complicated back-end like the shipping and payment processing. The easiest thing about Squarespace, though, it's the sell. It's free to set your website up and get everything ready at squarespace.com, and it's only when you're ready to launch that you need to pay anything at all. And when that time comes, you can save yourself 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain by heading to squarespace.com slash Click that link in the description and begin your journey expanding your brand to the masses online. Go on, do it now. 
I think we can all agree that the most exciting launch event that we saw take place last week was SpaceX's USS F-44 mission. Yep, this was Falcon Heavy Flight 004, and we saw the world's most powerful operational rocket thunder off the launch pad, carrying two separate satellites, one classified military satellite and the Tetra-1 microsatellite, which is a technology demonstration payload designed to test systems procedures for future military satellites. This was the first ever Falcon Heavy flight to carry a classified payload, and despite the massive capability of the Falcon Heavy, recovering all three boosters wasn't an option this time around. In order to deliver the payload to its intended orbit, the central core needed to burn all of its fuel during the ascent, leaving none left to allow a landing. That's why in the launch footage you can't see any grid fins or landing legs on the central core, because sadly it was just expended into the ocean. Not the first time this has happened for Falcon Heavy Mind, the central core of the rocket's maiden flight met a similar fate, but at least this time around it was a planned expenditure. <laughs> the two side boosters were able to burn back to the landing zone though, and we once again, after a three year hiatus, finally got to bear witness to another one of those amazing side-by-side -side landings of the two Falcon Heavy side boosters. Man, this never gets old. Despite the fact that the United States Space Force had to pay an increased launch cost to cover the loss of the Central Core, this mission reportedly came in at under 30% the price of a typical Delta IV Heavy launch, which clocks in at around 440 million US dollars. Now, as cool as the USS F-44 mission was, I think that the Falcon Heavy USS F-67 launch is going to be so much cooler. It's going to be launching in January next year. The payload is likely going to require vertical integration and an increased fairing size, and the rocket will once again need to expend its central core in order to deliver the payload to orbit. But that won't be enough. The side boosters will need to burn for longer during the ascent as well, so they won't have enough fuel to boost back to the landing zone. Instead, they'll land on drone ships simultaneously, so we'll get a double Falcon booster landing on the drone ships, just read the instructions, and a shortfall of gravitas. I absolutely cannot wait. Another major launch event we saw last week was the Mengtian launch. The Mengtian Laboratory Module is the third major module for China's space station to be launched, carried by a Long March 5B Y4 launch vehicle from the Wenchang Satellite Launch Site on the 31st of October. The Mengtian's name in Chinese translates to Dreaming of Heavens, and it's the second laboratory module for the Chinese space station, joining the Wentian Laboratory and the Tianhe Core module. Roughly 15 hours after the launch, the module successfully docked to the front port of the Tianhe Core module. Then, on the 3rd of November, it was successfully transferred from the front docking port to the side docking port of the Tianhe Core module, achieving the desired T-shaped configuration of the Core module and the Wentiang and Mengtian laboratory modules. The Mengtian is the final major module planned for the station for now, so this marks the end of the station's construction, though there is potential for expansion to up to six modules in the future if the demand is there. As for the next steps, the Tianzhou-5 resupply mission and Shenzhou-15 crew mission are both scheduled to launch to the space station before the end of the year. In its completed state, the Tiangong space station is roughly one-fifth the mass of the International Space Station, and it's roughly comparable in size to the now decommissioned Russian Mir space station. Anyway, back to SpaceX stuff now. On the 3rd of November, we saw the launch of a Falcon 9 from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Base, carrying the Hotbird 13G payload. This flight is the follow-up to the Hotbird 13F launch, which took place on the 15th of October. The Hotbird 13G satellite, along with its sister satellite, the Hotbird 13F, is a 4.5 metric ton communication satellite designed to provide up to a thousand television channels to over 160 million homes in Europe, North America, and the Middle East. Now, it would have been super cool if this mission used the same Falcon 9 first stage as the Hotbird 13F, but I think that would probably be pushing it for turnaround times, even for SpaceX. <laughs> the booster used on this mission was Booster 1067, which previously flew one Starlink mission, the Crew-3 and Crew-4 missions, the CRS-22 mission, and the Turksat-5B mission. Certainly one of the more diverse Falcon 9 boosters when it comes to variety of payload launched them. <laughs> the booster's successful landing on the drone ship, just read the instructions, wrapped up its seventh flight overall, and I'm looking forward to seeing it fly again, hopefully with equal success to last week's mission. Speaking of reusable first stages, Rocket Lab's Catch Me If You Can mission took place on the 4th of November. 
The name of this mission might give you an idea of their plans for the first stage. This was Rocket Lab's second launch in which an attempt to catch the first stage booster from the air using a helicopter was made. The last time they did this, the catch went well, but unfortunately the booster was later dropped by the pilot due to unexpected in-flight performance. This time around, things didn't go quite as well. A catch attempt wasn't made at all. We don't really know many details about why the pilot made the decision to abandon the catch attempt, but one can assume it was due to unexpected descent behavior of the first stage. Rocket Lab will still be attempting to recover the booster from the ocean though, so it's not completely lost. And despite the catch attempt not going as planned, the rest of the mission went well. The second stage successfully deployed the Swedish National Space Agency's Mesospheric Air Glow Aerosol Tomography and Spectroscopy, or MATS if you want to save some breath, satellite to low Earth orbit. MATS is designed to investigate atmospheric waves. It'll do this by imaging variation in the light emitted by oxygen molecules at 100 kilometers, as well as structures in the highest clouds of our atmosphere, which form around 80 kilometers up. Congratulations to Rocket Lab on their 30 second electron launch, and while it's disappointing that first stage recovery didn't go as planned, this stuff is not easy. It's easy to forget how rocky SpaceX's Falcon 9 recovery program was when they first started trying to recover the first stage. Failure is absolutely an expected component of rocket recovery, and I have no doubt that Rocket Lab are going to nail this eventually. Speaking of, uh, failures, <laughs> we were expecting to see an Antares 230 Plus rocket, carrying the CRS-18 Cygnus spacecraft to the International Space Station, launch on the 6th of November. However, the launch was unfortunately aborted, though there was nothing wrong with the weather, spacecraft, rocket or the launch site, rather there was a fire alarm at the Mission Operations Control Center, which meant that the Control Center staff had to evacuate. So a shame, but good news that nothing went wrong with the launch vehicle itself. The next attempt for this launch will be today, on the 7th of November, a few hours after this video goes live, so it may have already happened for you watching this now. In addition to the Mengtian launch, China also launched a Long March 3B rocket last week on the 5th of November. This carried a single ChinaSat-19 satellite to low Earth orbit, which is a communication satellite that will mainly provide communication services covering eastern China, Southeast Asia and most Pacific regions, including North American routes. Now, the memes were fun guys, but it's all over now. Tori Bruno finally has his BE-4 engines. Here they are being attached to the bottom of the first Vulcan rocket, and Blue Origin tweeted out some very nice shots of one of the engines in a test stand. I gotta show the video clip that Tori tweeted here to show you the might of these engines. They look impressive in the stand, but I really can't wait to see them powering the first Vulcan launch in early 2023. Fingers crossed there are no more delays. It was another busy week for Laon Aerospace. Last week, I decided to visit my roots and build and fly a recreation of the very first successful SSTO I ever flew in Kerbal Space Program. So in a way, this video took eight years to make. So give it a watch if that sounds interesting to you. There should be a card on screen taking you directly there, as well as a scrolling list of amazing people. They're my Patreon and YouTube channel members, and it's their generous support that allows me to continue making this content for you all. If you want to sign up, then you can follow the on-screen or in-description links. But yeah, that's it. Thank you all so much for watching, and goodbye.